We live in a world where we get to deal with the panoply of problems. From an engineering sense, we have made tremendous progress in dealing with certain classes of problems. I would even say that we have gained mastery over dealing with those kind of problems. There are classes of problems where we have made tremendous progress toward creating solutions, but not necessarily producing the actual solutions. And then there are classes of problems where we are still struggling, even clueless about how to take next steps toward achieving the solutions. I want to discuss with you three classes of problems that uh, we might all think about today. The first class of problem, what might generally call a hard problem. The problems are bounded, that can be approached scientifically, that obey laws of reason, potentially a laws of nature. And uh, we have uh, mechanisms, even design approaches to deal with them. Consider, for example, in the early 1970s, when the grocery industry was dealing with the huge challenge of inefficiencies with inventory management. They needed a mechanism to track their products that were being sold or that were being shipped to various stores. Engineers came to rescue and they developed a tool that allowed them to track these products and that had huge revenue ramifications. A decade earlier, the inefficiency pathology also afflicted the railroad industry they had a similar challenge of tracking rail cars that carried goods across the country because locating their precise location was very important for commercial reasons. Again, engineers came to rescue and came up with a technology that allowed them to track where the cars were exactly at a point in day. These two technologies, the one that emerged from the grocery industry and the one that emerged from the railroad industry over different spaces and different time concepts, married and created what we now take for granted and is one of the most humblest technologies that we know from a design sense, the bra barcode. The barcode essentially created the modern supply chain system, had dramatic um, impact on the way we conduct our business. From avocados to bananas, every imperishable good now has a, uh, every perishable good has an imperishable barcoded identity. In a sense, we all do, too. From an engineering angle, a barcode isn't that different from the artistic concept of sculptures, where you have a defined objective, where uh, a specification-driven engineering approach that led to barcode could also be applied to certain aspects of artistic creation, artistic design. For example, look at these uh, creations. What thousand years ago, you're looking at the dancing Shiva, known as Nataraja, and also the avatars of Vishnu. They were all been commissioned by someone, or they were produced because of a social desire, or for even religious or devotional needs that the public wanted. So, in a sense, barcodes aren't that different from the sculptures because they do represent a form of truth. As individual systems, they have value. Coalescing together, they also create systems of systems. Consider the, the magnificent Chola Temple in South India, in, this, in the town of Tanjavur, that's been standing, and it's a living temple that's uh, you know, performing uh, the social duties of being an active temple. So, in this regard, engineering and art, art do not really have such a big difference. When you have a very precise goal, and when you know the objective, and when you know the boundary of the problem, you can actually solve the hard problem, as Russ Eckhoff, the management philosopher, once thought. This could be literally taken uh, upon by a technical approach. A second class of problems which get a little bit more complicated are what we might call soft problems, where human behavior comes into act, and also the, the role of uncertainty becomes dominant, and we are really struggling. We have made enormous progress in understanding these elements, but we are still far away from uh, producing useful uh, solutions. For example, Let's see what happened in the early 2000s in the city of Stockholm, a gorgeous um, city known as Venice of North, renowned for its bridges and so forth. But they had an unmanageable congestion challenge. People were very frustrated because the commute times were 
elongated, and people really wanted to uh, ha wanted the city councilors to do something about it. So the obvious suggestion was, okay, well, let's build another road, let's build another bridge, and um, you know, um, but the city already had dozens of bridges. But this time, the city councilors paused for reflection. They thought uh, maybe we should get some outside advice, and they invited some consultants from IBM. So what the IBM engineers did was they took a very modular approach, broke down the city of Stockholm into manageable segments, essentially to understand. They put hundreds of thousands of transponders around the city that captured hundreds of thousands of photographs that provided lots of data points that the IBM engineers could reconstruct and produce what can be called as a total systems model. So they understand where the bottlenecks are, where the related areas perform, where the unrelated areas actually cripple the system, and see uh, what the effects were. The results of this analysis were then pr presented to the City Council of Stockholm, and then the city councilors said that, okay, we are not building a bridge, we are not building another road. Instead, what we are going to do is start charging people when they travel during peak hours. So the whole idea of uh, congestion pricing was applied in practice in the city of Stockholm, and uh, for the DC metro area residents, we all use Easy Pass, and we can travel at 55 miles per hour on a Dulles uh, uh, toll road without even needing to stop. Such is the nature of uh, the performance of these technologies, iteratively, successively improved over time. The results of this experiment, which was later on passed on by, uh, uh, by the city of Stockholm as a permanent referendum, had huge social effects. People started um, um, commuting, uh, carpooling together. They started taking public transportation. There was a, a notable decrease in carbon emissions and so forth. So it is one of those situations where you can tackle aspects of the system, but still human behavior at large remains uh, to be uh, the dominant variable here. So in another way, the concept of continuous optimization that IBM really championed, put into practice, is also used by Google. Because they collect enormous amounts of data points, and you can see a picture of the Google map of the precise location where we are right now. And uh, this is a, a beautiful mashup of various tools. It is not a single system. It is a collection of tools. For example, imagine the 3D panoramic view uh, facility that the Google Images offers. Also, the user-provided photographs. Also, you can provide reviews of your own. And then uh, it also uh, shows you, color through color coding, the intensity of traffic in a specific area that alters your behavior even before you take or decide to take on a specific journey. Consider the yellow, the green, the red, the dark red uh, options that Google allows us to have. So in a way, IBM and Google have provided what could be considered a pointillistic approach to engineering design problem. Consider, for example, this magnificent piece by Sir Claude Berry where he, where he painfully uh, develops this full picture of fireworks in the, uh, with, in the background of a celebration. Dot by dot, a full picture is developed. Data point by data point, a solution is developed in the engineering sense. It can also be considered an impressionistic approach where the, the realities are shaky, they are unstable, as is common with traffic congestion. You cannot solve the issue of uh, traffic congestion because we are uh, in the equation there. And Van Gogh actually demonstrates this through his uh, approach in this phenomenal uh, uh, creation where he also makes it a point to filter out the differences between natural light from the stars and the artificial light from the gas lamps that are at the, at the bank. So in this regard, a easy pass or a Google map isn't that different than a pointillistic or an impressionistic portrait. So to borrow again the concept of Russ Eckhoff, a soft problem cannot be solved. It can only be resolved, much as um, a, how a clinician goes about a differential diagnosis approach, understanding the uncertainties, re respecting the unknowns, and arriving at a diagnosis. So it's almost a clinical approach to engineering design. It's a clinical approach to artistic design. Now comes the fun part, the third category of problems where we are completely struggling with. These are issues that involve deepest and the deepest uh, value systems and the belief sets and the ideologies 
and um, um, that have that make things very complicated. In English, we call it Washington. <laughs> Consider this example. A couple years ago, we had a major panic because of the Ebola hemorrhagic fever outbreak in Western Africa. There were numerous. Uh, um, approaches that were suggested. The most notable one that we all learned about was the, the need for a new vaccine. Uh, we also tried um, containing um, the, the outbreak through, um, um, through other approaches, uh, such as quarantine and so forth. And um, the panic definitely was demonstrated. It was amplified by both traditional and online media. And the fear factor associated with the disease, the sheer disfiguration and the fatality rates clearly created a lot of uh, panic in the society. There was also one thing that we completely ignored. The burial rituals that are in the local community. It is, one of the, it is one of the things that demonstrates how we completely ignore the context in which a specific problem is occurring. So turns out that had an important effect in the transmissibility of the vector here. So that was, uh, that was something that we did not really truly uh, consider uh, in the issue. But if you take on an issue like Ebola or climate change or something like that, you, if you try to segment it, there are elements um, of the problem that are hard. For example, in this case, you, there, are, uh, there are situations whose hardness can be attacked by technologies such as a barcode. Uh, imagine its application in uh, tracking blood samples, patients, equipment, supplies, and so forth. So there are aspects of those. And then there are elements that are soft, the softness that can be attacked through um, a Google Maps or what we might call a surveillance technology where you're collecting large amounts of data sets to truly understand how a population is behaving or even for epidemiological analysis um, going forward. So you have, the, you have the hard problem and the soft problem as part of this big messy problem. And the real challenge is to understand the remainder of the problem, which is often abstract. And abstractness, even from an artistic um, angle is very different. Consider how um, JMW Turner approaches abstraction through his um, uh, fabulous creation here, uh, a deeply engineered system uh, ship uh, that's under in, in snowstorm. As experts uh, uh, seem to suggest uh, here, um, there is a deliberate confusion of uh, elements as people talk about, and there's a, a commotion of form, of color, and so forth that uh, makes it uh, really powerful. But Kandinsky approaches in a completely different way, where he takes an engineered system like a ship and uh, puts it in a completely man-made situation like a, a sea battle. How do you go about dealing with that? So you have two very different styles of abstractions of approaching the exact same engineered system. The abstraction gets even more uh, challenging if you uh, go to a different level. For example, Joan Mitchell has this kinetic um, uh, representation in her art, and Rothko has a very different um, set of uh, uh, attributes in his uh, approaches. So this is an abstraction at a very different level. Even abstraction has different avatars that we are trying to grapple with. And ultimately, as uh, Pollock demonstrates through his approaches, we just do not know, and I say this Humbly, from an engineer's perspective, we do not know how to deal with this. So this is something we really need um, help with. And I think uh, uh, artists are able to offer perspectives that we are just not trained to look at. We do not even have the perspective, let alone the context, to deal with. So this is an area for rich collaboration, um, as, I, as I see. So messy problems need to be dissolved, as Akoff puts it. You cannot solve them, you cannot resolve them. What you have to do is transform the problem space. You have to transform or reframe the metaphor. Um, any engineer uh, who has taken basic mathematics here uh, gets to do Fourier analysis, where you're taking a set of data points in the time domain, because you cannot deal with them altogether effectively, you're transforming them into frequency domain, where you have much better control over the situation. That's exactly what needs to be done here. We need to transform the, the context in which these uh, the, um, the problems are occurring, so we get a much better handle on the things. In other, stated differently, engineers need to get um, the better at appreciating and dealing with abstractions. This all takes back to the point that I made earlier. 
each of us has a value system. Each of us is embedded uh, with a, a belief um, system. And um, as it turns out in Washington, we cannot really agree on what day of the week it is because that's how powerful our values are. And um, so this is uh, uh, productive or counterproductive depending on how you um, uh, see it, but we often get stuck in the resist uh, method, uh, uh, modality without uh, contributing to much uh, progress. And this is only amplified by the various tools that we now have at our disposal in the form of social media. Each of us gets to have our own voice and you couple that with the anonymity and that actually complicates the things even more. So each of us has a different voice, each of us has a different value system. How do you go about considering them together is a big challenge for engineering design. I would even say the next big grand challenge for engineering design. I know I have landed pretty hard on Washington policy, but this happens all the time in engineering design too. We call it design constituencies. You put a bunch of engineers in a room, uh, preferably trained ones, and ask them to design an airplane, and each of them is gonna come up with a completely different design based on their um, perspective and priority. I think my favorite is the armament group. Maybe the second one is a power plant group because uh, they're pretty subtle in, uh, in the way they express themselves. <laughs> but, at the end of the day, if I ask them all to develop an airplane that flies and it has to perform with a great degree of safety, efficiency, and put all the highest stakes possible, the engineering minds get together and come up with the technology that does those things because you have to meet those requirements, you have to meet those specifications because lives are at stake. You don't even have to do anything in engineering for something to fail, it'll automatically reveal itself. Such is the nature and the responsibility of engineering design. The point that I want to make is how do you thrive amidst this diversity of values. And that's something both art is trying to grapple with, and that's something engineering is trying to wrestle with. And I think together we can do a much better job in trying to understand, perhaps even expand our perspectives or even uh, accelerate our um, performance in uh, many of the wicked uh, problems. For example, this preamble to the US Constitution from Alabama to Wyoming, you have a range of very different uh, 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 pictures and perspectives that ultimately bring us all together. Uh, and I think perhaps uh, the best metaphor uh, for engineering to work with disciplines such as art, maybe even anthropology and philosophy, is um, um, cubism. <laughs> the analytic cubism, which is simultaneously geometric, yet celebrates abstraction and we do not know how to deal with those things from, from a formal training sense. It is also able to um, allow us to see from multiple perspectives. Now that's something that we need to really get good at as I've mentioned several times during my talk. Because to do that, ultimately we all need to transcend the disciplinary Berlin walls we have created um, um, around us. So that's something uh, to um, keep in mind. After all, this is a pomegranate and depends on how you see it because uh, the creator of this, um, um, of this piece uh, put it best. If there were only one truth, you couldn't paint a hundred canvases on the same theme. So thanks to Picasso and thanks to you all. Uh -huh.